to our last plenary of today. Um, as the 19th century military strategist Karl von Clausewitz said, war is a continuation of politics by other means. In other words, war is normal and acceptable. The industrialized warfare of the 20th, 20th century was the bloodiest ever. Rumors of war and our security anxiety fed the institutionalization of vast military industrial complexes. The tragic irony is that our security anxiety has made the world, world terminally insecure. We have it in our power to create a world that uses thinking instead of violence to resolve conflict. We know that peace is, comes from addressing justice in a process that never ends. Perhaps the Iroquois Six Nations got it right when they vested final authority for declaring we, uh, war to the women. <laughs> But what psychologist James Hillman calls our terrible love of war continues unabated, powered by gold and God. War is highly profitable, but three quarters of the shooting wars since World War II have not been waged between nation states, but by states on their own peoples. These resource wars against indigenous and local populations are deliberate grabs by local elites, usually in cahoots with faraway empires. As Jason Clay said, environmental degradation and human, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the rule of international conflict is that states are killing their own citizens to get access to their homelands. Environmental degradation and human rights violations go hand in hand. The U.S. Empire's military expenditures now approximate those of the rest of the world combined, three quarters of a trillion dollars a year. As Chalmers Johnson points out, U.S. militarism threatens the fabric of the Republic here at home. Our 725 military bases in 133 countries are financed by our record debt, the classic final nail in the coffin of collapsing empires. It's a fiscal train wreck that will cripple social spending and indenture generations to come. Clearly, such behavior is not rational. James Hillman proposes that the archetype of war is so deeply embedded in our psyche that we worship it as divine, as holy. We're the only species that kills for ideologies and murders in the name of a martial god. Something much, much deeper has to explain why we're all prisoners of war. That's the psycho-spiritual realm Ed Tick has been probing for the past 30 years. He believes the wounds of war emanate from the mythic dimensions of our consciousness. The archetypal drive for war has haunted us from time immemorial, scarring us with transgenerational traumas to our very souls. He believes transforming the warrior archetype is where redemption lies. Ed is a true healer. He's also a psychotherapist, a mythologist, educator, and ordained interfaith minister. He's renowned for his innovative work with survivors of severe trauma and violence, especially combat veterans. Earlier this month, he addressed the, stra the staff at Walter Reed Hospital in a talk that was simulcast um, to U.S. military facilities all over the world. He's, his powerful and eloquent orig and very original books include War and the Soul, which I highly recommend. Walter Reed Hospital ordered 350 copies of the book. Ed recently founded Soldier's Heart as a nonprofit initiative that seeks to return truth to the war experience and foster community-based veterans programs for safe return home. Ed came to the conclusion that the only way to escape the demons of war trauma is to face them, to forgive and to seek forgiveness. His treatment strategies are working. For many years, he's led reconciliation journeys with veterans back to the scene of the horror to help heal their warrior's identity. He's long worked with vets to return to society as guardians of future generations, to tell the truth about war, and to restrain and reduce violence. Ed knows and shows that we can heal the holes in our souls and stop the cycles of violence. Please join me in welcoming one of the true healers and true spiritual warriors of our time, Ed Tick. Thank you. Thank you. Bless you all. Bless you for being here. Bless you for your love, your devotion, your activism. 
We are all spiritual warriors, and we all must be. Of course, a special thank you to Nina and Kenny and the Bioneer's vision. It is reuniting the planet, and we are all doing it together. Large and small, it doesn't matter. There's uh, no scale in the divine eyes. We all count, and we are all healing our beloved planet and each other and our societies together. As the First Nations people teach us, we always begin with the medicine. And so I would like to begin my sharing with you today with the song that Sitting Bull, Tatanka Yatake, gave to his people when he became the head tribe, uh, head chief of all the Lakota. He sang over and over again, simply but beautifully. You tribes, behold me. The chiefs of old are gone. Myself, I shall take courage. You tribes, behold me, the chiefs of old are gone. Myself, I shall take courage. This song is most relevant to us today. And in fact, the second thing that happens in powwow after the medicine is brought in is that the warriors are honored. So you tribes, behold me, I would like to ask all the veterans present, all the active duty service people present, and all survivors of war and violence, please stand and let us behold you and thank you and welcome you home. The chiefs of old are gone. Well, we have a few here, and that's good, but we all know that the old ways, the indigenous ways, the wisdom of the people and of the earth have been nearly de uh, terribly devastated and are nearly gone, and we are gathered in community to restore them and bring them back. Myself, I shall, myself, I shall take courage. Every one of us must be on a moral and spiritual journey. Every one of us might, must find courage. Courage, you remember, Hemingway defined out of the Spanish Civil War as grace under pressure. We are under terrible pressure, and we all must have the grace to stand up before it and take the right action to end the violence together. So we are on this journey together. It takes immense courage. And it especially takes courage, and we want to have the courage and give the courage to our veterans. I'm quite honored and humbled to not only be here with you, but to follow Eve Ensler. Um, perhaps we went alphabetically. It's, she's, of course, a hard act to follow. She is representing the vagina. That's V-A. I'm representing our veterans. That's V-E. Veterans and vaginas and all the rest of us need lots of courage to do our work. I called this talk with you today, uh, Return of the Ghost Dancers. Probably many of you remember what the ghost dance was. In American history and in the First Nation history, the ghost dance was a messianic movement that grew up at the end of the 19th century, during which time many, many of the indigenous people who no longer could bear arms against the genocide of the Euro-American Euro culture, began dancing, praying, chanting, as they always had. But the ghost dance was a movement that would, they believed, bring back the spirits of the dead, the dead warriors, the dead wives and children, the dead earth, the dead buffalo. And they danced and danced and prayed because they saw the spirits. They know the spirits are there and with us all the time. And we know also that that dance and that movement was murdered at Wounded Knee. War is epidemic. It has been since recorded history. I have a Show and tell item. Some of you probably saw yesterday's USA Today. The headline reads, veteran, ca veteran stress cases up sharply. Mental illness is now number two injury. It's good that the VA is admitting this. 
It's good that it's getting this much publicity. There's two mistakes in this headline. One is post-traumatic stress disorder is not an individual pathology. It is not a mental illness. One Korean War combat veteran shouted to me and to our whole community, I am not mentally ill. I was brutalized by the world. The second mistake is claiming that the psychological and spiritual and moral dimensions of the war wound are the number two injury. They're number one. War has been epidemic since the beginning of recorded history. We've had over 14,600 wars in the last 5,000 years of recorded history. And those are only the, the wars with definitive outcomes. Historians haven't countered, uh, counted the stalemates. So this is two or three wars a year for every year of the last 5,000. Humanity reels, the earth reels. The devastation of modern technological warfare is far worse than war has ever been. Today, the way we practice war, and tragically, sadly, shamefully, the way our country practices war against the earth, against our neighborhoods, against each other, but how practices warfare, especially overseas, against other people, amounts to both genocide and gaiacide. We are, when we go to war now, we use such advanced technology with such brutal firepower moving at such rapid speed that it is impossible to go to war, to participate in combat in the modern era and come out sane. Can't do it. War has surpassed the ability of the human being to tolerate and come out unchanged. The only type of personality that comes out of modern warfare, the same as they went in, is a psychopathic or sociopathic person. That means, of course, that the practice of war is psychopathic and sociopathic, and that everybody we put through it has to become psychopathic in order to participate. How do you come home from that? Our world now is populated by the ghosts of war. All over the country, all over the world, people perceive these ghosts. Our veterans who have nightmares of the dead are not just seeing an individual pathology, they're seeing the ghosts. In Vietnam today, in Korea today, in Africa today, and among the First Nations here on Turtle Island, people perceive the ghosts through their dreams, through their visions, through their flashbacks. In Europe, the ghosts populate all of Western and Eastern Europe from World War II and from the Cold War. Therapists from Europe report their countries are in severe depression. People they treat today who were born just in the last 20 years are still having the dreams and the pathologies of their parents and their grandparents who participated in World War II and in the Cold War era. And they are reporting entire countries in severe depression. These are the ghosts of war that are still on the planet possessing us all. Now, post-traumatic stress disorder nightmares, of course, are pathologized as individual problems uh, rooted in, in personal psychology. However, when we take the spiritual approach, when we understand how war affects us, how it damages our soul, we can see that these nightmares are visits from the spirits, the spirits of the dead, the spirits of the land, trying to talk to us, trying to return to us, asking us for help. So what is post-traumatic stress disorder? Well, it's classified as, an, as a stress and anxiety disorder. It's not that. That is a civilian category. It is loaded with stress and anxiety, but stress and anxiety are not the words to describe the emotions we experience during war. It's not an individual pathology or illness. It's not a medical condition. 
and it's certainly not healed by the battery of medications that we drench our veterans and survivors in. That silences them, it doesn't bring healing. Let's talk about what PTSD is, because that, when we hear it, we know how to respond to it, and I can affirm to you that it can be healed. We can heal PTSD, we can bring our veterans home, and all other survivors of PTSD, if we respond in the fullness, to the fullness of the wound. So first, PTSD is a soul wound. A soul wound means that all of our functions, all the functions ever attributed to the soul are distorted, damaged, lost, confused by the horrible wounding of war. So the way we think, the way we feel, the way we act, the way we love, the way we um, participate in employment, whether or not we can participate in, our, in society, our moral sensibility, our aesthetics are all profoundly distorted and disturbed by the experience of war. PTSD is a cry of the soul trapped in the underworld. It's a frozen war consciousness. War, again, is so penetrating and so disturbing that it takes over the mind, and PTSD makes the whole world look like a war zone. And the self shrinks and barely stays alive and tries to tolerate daily life while it looks like the world is exploding around us. So instead of post-traumatic stress disorder, if we need to use the acronym, PTSD, post-terror soul distress. PTSD is also a social disorder. Our entire tribe is disordered when we are at war. The PTSD symptoms that individuals suffer are also our epidemic social ills. Suicide, homicide, crime rates, divorce and um, child abuse and domestic violence, drug and alcohol abuse, all of the things we are suffering the most as epidemic conditions in our society are the symptoms of PTSD. The whole culture is disturbed. Post PTSD, post-terror social disorder. It does not make any sense, we all know this, to tell a culture, a country, go shopping while a few of us go off to war. When a country is at war, nothing is normal for any of us. We all feel the pain, we all know it, we all have the disturbance. <laughs> PTSD also, if we have to fit it into psychological categories, is better understood as an identity disorder. That is, the experience of war is a death and rebirth. It's an initiation. Traditional cultures since the beginning of time have used the journey into warriorhood, not to create people who destroy and kill, but to create people who understand and appreciate the preciousness and the fragility of life and who are here to protect it. That's what a spiritual warrior is and does. Our First Nations people teach us that their warriors are peacemakers and peace bringers, not not destroyers. <clears throat> so, an identity disorder. When we've sent people off to war, they are changed forever. They become different forever. Who am I now is a question every survivor has to answer. The death of innocence, the death of naivete has occurred. And the death of the old self has occurred. We have to help our survivors find their new self, create a new identity that includes the wounding and includes the war experience and brings it back to all of us, to the tribe. And PTSD is spiritual distress that we are all in. Uh, John Zemmler is a veteran of first Gulf War <clears throat> and of secret operations in Europe. And he said to me recently, 10 years from now, when we all have PTSD, let us be worthy of the wound. The conditions we're living in today, in war and 
in peace at home are the conditions that bring about post-traumatic stress disorder. It's rampant in our inner cities. It's rampant in our prisons. It's rampant in homes. We all have the wound. We need to listen to it and be worthy of it. It is a universal PTSD. It, again, is not a mental illness. Every one of us will get it under in violent and stressful enough conditions. It's a universal response to severe stress. So PTSD is also the world soul crying out its anguish to us all, begging us, like global warming, to pay attention to the health of the earth. PTSD is begging us to pay attention to the health and well-being of our souls and our societies. What is the usual contemporary response? We all know this. Give our survivors massive amounts of medication, separate them, send them off to hospitals, let them go off and hide in the woods by themselves, uh, or practice therapeutic strategies that teach them not to talk about the wound, not to talk about their experiences, but avoid anything that might cause you stress. Well, war hurts, and it should. So we practice the good old don't ask, don't tell strategy about war. We don't ask the veterans their stories, and they don't tell them to us. And that's wrong, and we have to stop it. <laughs> this old strategy that isolates and medicates our veterans is effectively cuts the tongues out of our warriors. We need to restore their voices in our communities and in our societies and around the world. Some of you no doubt have heard the famous saying, uh, Aeschylus, the Greek playwright said, truth is the first casualty of war. When we restore the stories, when we restore the voices of our veterans and survivors, then we can restore truth. We can hear and respond to PTSD just like we can to global warming. We have to restore these silenced voices. And when we understand that PTSD is a spiritual wound and a social disorder, then the recipe is clear. And again, it's what the traditional people have been teaching us forever. The recipe for healing PTSD is spirituality and community. <clears throat> There's many ways we can respond. When we understand that it's an identity disorder, we can work with our survivors to achieve an identity transformation that includes their wounds. Um, we cannot and should not try to be pain-free. In the Civil War, PTSD was called Soldier's Heart. My organization takes its name from that. We should not be pain-free, but rather, as all of us have been saying, there's immense amount of pain in the world we need to face together. And instead of being pain-free, we need to be in a new and constructive and open-hearted and compassionate relationship to our own and each other's pain and the world pain. Understanding that PTSD is a soul wound teaches us, again, as traditional cultures have been teaching us forever, that the, uh, the way we heal soul wounds is through initiation. Our PTSD is an incomplete initiation. Our veterans and survivors are stuck in the underworld, and we need to go down there and meet them in hell where they're stuck and walk out with them. And <laughs> When, when we do this, when we do this, we, our hearts will be broken also, but we will discover depths of love and commitment and devotion that only people who have served in hell together know. And we are invited to share that, but we have to have the courage to expose ourselves to so much pain, to see things we don't want to see and know things we don't want to know. We can complete the initiations and bring them back from hell. Many veterans, as they heal, say, 
example, I'm no longer a Vietnam veteran. I'm no longer a Somalia or Grenada or Panama or Gulf War veteran. I'm a warrior whose service was in Vietnam or Panama or El Salvador. I'm a warrior. I've joined the world class of spiritual warriors. And my service was unfortunate, but I can carry it because I've returned and I have a new identity with new meaning. Now, understanding PTSD as a social disorder also helps us with the recipe. PTSD sounds a citizen's call to action. The Veterans Administration, the government, does not have the resources or the money or the will or the know-how to bring our veterans home and bring healing. We need to reformulate our relationship to veterans. Vets, soldiers, warriors put their lives on the line for the rest of us. Whether or not we think the cause is legitimate is beside the point. This transcends politics. Most people, go to, when they go into the service, go to preserve and protect the people and the country and the values that they love. And we and are willing to sacrifice their lives for that. They often only find out that <clears throat> the service was illegitimate when they're in the middle of it, when they're in the middle of combat and they can't come back. So you, we need to say to all of our survivors, you protected us, now it's our turn to protect you. You went out on the front lines for us, now come back in, come back into the tribal circle, into the community circle, and let us protect you. You served in our name, now we will serve you. There are two things we must do as a consequence of war. We must practice this responsibility for our veterans and all of their family, the widow and the orphan. And we must practice the same responsibility to anyone we have ever harmed anywhere on the planet. I, I leave, I leave We're working on it. <laughs> We're working on it. Uh, tomorrow, at the end of our Bioneers Conference, I leave for my seventh trip to Vietnam. And when we go to Vietnam, our veterans meet with their veterans. I can't tell you how beautiful it is to run a reconciliation group with American and Canadian and Australian and Viet Cong and North Vietnamese Army and Southern Army veterans, all loving and embracing each other as brothers and sisters who have survived the same hell. In, in addition to that, we participate in Vietnamese culture, so the Vietnam becomes a place, not a war, of course. We participate in their spirituality, which is Buddhism, and has protected them. There's not much PTSD in Vietnam, which is counterintuitive. Psychology teaches us they were traumatized. It, there has to be there. Well, they were severely physically damaged. We are damaged in our soul. Vietnam is healthy, and they want us to come back and practice forgiveness, welcoming. They want to heal our veterans. So we can create a veteran-friendly society. And if you are, are interested, please come to the panel discussion this afternoon. I have a list of about 40 or 50 things we can do and I am doing in our communities to create a veteran-friendly society where our veterans come home and heal in the tribal circle. But for now, my time is almost up. I want to end with a quick story about one modern ghost dancer. This happened in Vietnam, too. A man named Bob was an infantry grunt. He participated in the destruction of villages. Uh, he had severe PTSD, divorced twice, nightmares on the verge of his third divorce. He had over 200 college credits, but didn't, couldn't finish a degree, couldn't keep a job. We went back to Vietnam twice. He saw the ghosts, not only in his nightmares, but as we were driving through the rice paddies. He saw the people he killed and the people we bombed, and the children, and our veterans, and his, his comrades who had died. He saw them all walking toward him as ghosts. And in particular, there was one 14-year-old boy 
That this was the first Viet Cong soldier he had killed. And he saw this boy for decades in his nightmares and then walking to him again in Vietnam. So he saw the ghosts. He knows they're real. We identified his wound, again, not as individual psychopathology, but as a soul wound. And he embraced it as a soul wound. And we went in search of the recipe in Vietnam and through spiritual restoration techniques that could bring soul healing. So we, uh, I, we honored his dead. He went back to where he served, where his comrades fell, and we prayed. We honored the Vietnamese dead. We, re we practiced reconciliation with the, these former enemies and entered a universal brotherhood. We did rituals for the souls of the Vietnamese, the lives that he took. We practiced restoration projects. We built a school in the Mekong Delta. Uh, he adopted some Vietnamese children and sponsors them in school. And finally, we climbed to a sacred pagoda and did a memorial service for that one 14-year-old boy. And at the end of this long process, during that ceremony, he saw the boy's soul come to him on top of a sacred mountain, Black Lady Mountain in Vietnam. The boy's soul came to him beaming, smiling, with arms out, embracing him and saying, thank you, I've returned. From now on, I am your spiritual ally and guide and friend, and we will walk together and serve together for the rest of our lives. <clears throat> Bob began sleeping like a baby. This was seven years ago. He has not had a combat nightmare since then. He's reconciled with his wife. He's got a great marriage. He continues to support um, Vietnamese children and veterans. He's active in his community in veterans affairs, and he's become a modern ghost dancer. So I end with this song, again from our first people, a Paiute ghost dance song, because when we embrace PTSD this way, life can return to all of us, including the spirits. The Paiute people sang, the father will descend the earth will tremble. Everybody will arise. Stretch out your hands. We shall live again. We shall live again. Thank you and bless you.